because we never did have the money to pay anybody for a long time. We now are in a little bit better position and it's gotten a little better. Uh, but <coughs> I think um, the dream really came from, uh, uh, goes back to Conrad Lawrence and my professor Eckert Hess, who uh, looked at animals from their point of view. And uh, uh, Eckert Hess, uh, was the one who introduced ethology to American psychologists. And uh, <coughs> I was a student, and I worked with uh, pigeons and doves. And uh, now I'm working with wolves and uh, bison and so on. But the basic principles uh, <coughs> are working with hand-raised uh, or tame animals that are not, afra are not afraid of people in a situation where they can show as much of their normal behavior as is possible. Uh, the wolves can't do everything they do in a while. The bison can't do everything in a while. This morning, uh, they were running around all over the place, apparently migrating. Uh, <laughs> but they were confined by the fence. Fortunately, they respected the fence. This time? <laughs> this time. <laughs> well, they have for a long time. And so, <clears throat> I, I think trying to show people what animals are like in their own right, and that's really the contribution that ethology has made. And uh, also, when it comes to preserving animals, it's not the rational and scientific approach that will do it, but it's the emotional investment that we as people have. And yes, the science is important uh, to have some facts on which to base decisions, but basically, if you want to save the habitat or the animals in it, it's because <coughs> they appeal to you at an emotional uh, level. That, that's the important thing. I may briefly tell you how I got to where I was. Uh, some of you may have heard this, so I, uh, if you forgive me. 
but uh, <coughs> I was born in 1930 and uh, lived in a small town called Hector Water, about 350 people, <coughs> and essentially the country. My grandparents had uh, <coughs> not a farm, but they had animals and they farmed 10 acres. My grandfather was the mayor and uh, he uh, <coughs> was a self-taught musician. He had a choir and he had a, a band. <coughs> And um, uh, they all uh, went on, on Sunday, they went out uh, to four walks in the countryside. And my grandfather never worked on Sunday. He had a, a bar barometer, which I now have, and he would have when and he'd uh, <coughs> take a look and see what the weather was going to do. And he never had any problems with anyone else. Anyway, uh, I was clearly imprinting on this kind of habitat and the animals were always uh, the cows and the chickens and, and uh, the goats and so on. And uh, later on, four years later, when we moved away, whenever I came on vacation, uh, the joke is that Eric goes to see the animals first before he says hello to people. <laughs> and um, eventually, uh, I went, uh, we moved again and again, and I ended up in Weimar, uh, which is uh, Thuringia. That's, you may have heard of the Weimar Republic and later on became uh, East Germany for a while. And that's where I went to high school. I had a very gifted uh, biology teacher, Dr. Stengel was his name. <coughs> and uh, he, he was a, a real pedagogue. Um, he would, uh, I, by the way, I had the worst biology teachers and I had the best. And the best one was Stengel. He uh, uh, told us to go and find a, um, a piece of uh, habitat anywhere and study it and then come back at the end of the semester and tell them we found. He never gave us ins instructions how to write a paper or anything. And so another friend uh, and I, I forgot his name, we <coughs> found a, a fairly large area behind our uh, the house where we lived on the edge of town. We made a map. Uh, we took an inventory of all the trees and all the rabbit warrens and all the ant uh, uh, hills and all the fox dens and we <coughs> uh, identified the animals and um, even the grasses and, and so on and so we were totally left to our own devices and uh, then um, I remember the paper that I wrote was a page and a half but I didn't know how to do it but what Stengel did is he said okay you guys uh, took the whole class out and we gave a guided tour through our field, uh, uh, field study area. And uh, so that was really my, my beginning. Um, and uh, this man influenced me greatly because I never told students really what to do when I was teaching. <coughs> I said, you pick the animal that you want. I did give more guidance on how to write it up. Uh, uh, but uh, I felt that when people do what they want to do, they invest all their, <coughs> their interest in the motivation and, and energy in it. That's really the best way to do it. Uh, none of this, uh, you know, um, uh, training gets to jump through hoops. You have to do it on your own. And that's what I owe to Dr. Stengel. I've never forgotten that. <coughs> well, the, uh, my dad was in the <coughs> war. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> well, he would start out in, in Austria. And then in, he was a military policeman, by the way. Uh, then he went. Uh, was to Czechoslovakia, then to Poland, then to, to France, and then to Russia, where he ended up in 1941, I think it was. What, what was the Russian campaign? 41? 43? Anyway, I think it was 41. And uh, northeast of Moscow, that's how far they got. Then, of course, the big rivers <coughs> came, and uh, we didn't hear from him for a long time, but eventually he came back. And uh, <coughs> meanwhile, um, uh, we went to school and um, did the best we could, and when the war was over, he came back uh, eventually uh, from Russian prison camp. He was quite, quite ill, and, but he, he survived. And, uh, and then <coughs> I uh, had my, uh, well, before he came back, living in Weimar, <coughs> the Americans uh, came uh, and took the town. And uh, a few days later, um, we were all, uh, well, cursed is the way. <coughs> Policemen came by, all people had to go to the train station, 
and we were hauled off to concentration camp Buchenwald, which was just three miles from there on the other side of the hill. We knew it was there, but we didn't know what was going on in there, at least most people didn't. It's just hard to understand for uh, people who weren't there. And uh, that's where my, uh, my whole world uh, kind of uh, collapsed because, you know, like our Boy Scouts here, we believe in, in the virtues and the, the good things. Uh, uh, and Germany fought a just war and all this sort of thing from our perspective. And here I am uh, meeting prisoners, emaciated, uh, some of them uh, were dying every day. And I met people <coughs> whose family had been gassed. And uh, just my whole world uh, just uh, fell apart. And I had a work detail in the, um, in the uh, laundry. There was a big pile of um, combs, uh, belts, and, um, and, uh, and billfolds from the murdered people. And it was my job to sort them out, pitch them here and here and here. There were two people in there. One was a Czech man who was 42 years old, and one was a young Dutchman, 21 years old. And uh, he spoke German. And I asked him, why, why are you here? And he said, well, uh, I had a, a Jewish uh, a fiance. I hit her. She was found. And we were found. She went to Bergen-Belsen, the same place where Anne Frank went, and she died there. And he went here as punishment uh, at the concentration camp. Now, uh, you have to remember, when, when, we were, when we grew up in Germany, we were told that loyalty to your group, to your family, to your country, is the highest virtue. We were also taught to, to be fair and all that sort of thing. And here was someone who had been loyal, uh, not only to his country, uh, but to his fiancé, and yet he was punished for it. So there was complete uh, uh, <coughs> denial of those things which were held up to us as, as virtues. And that just just, uh, just shook me up and, and just, uh, just uh, about uh, collapsed. So, uh, and there were a few other incidents uh, like that. And uh, <coughs> so I met a Russian uh, re release prisoner there. He called me over and he said, uh, you like the Russians? What well, I was going to say, I mean, I had nothing personal against Russians. In fact, I knew some Russians, but I didn't say anything. He said, well, he said, if you like the Russians, you stay. Now, this is what in, in 1945. If you like the Russians, you stay. If not, you leave tomorrow, because I will go home, visit my family, if they're still alive, and I will come back here and I'll be a guard in Buchenwald. The first indication I had that, yes, the Russians were going to come, and then they were going to have a, uh, a camp again, and so on. So I went home to my mother, and I said, look, uh, we have to, uh, <coughs> I want to leave. Because my grandparents lived in Hesse, which is a uh, castle, it's in the next province over. And uh, that was not to be part of the division, East Germany, West Germany, eventually. And so my aunt and I, we went with a little dog, and uh, we got on the road. And uh, three days later, we were there. And sure enough, in September 1945, there came the Russians. My mother stayed because she uh, didn't want to um, uh, uh, <coughs> be away if, in case my dad came back. In the end, he was uh, in prison camp, uh, Russian prison <coughs> camp after the war in Romania. And he was one of the few people too sick uh, to be shipped east, and he came back. And, if my mother hadn't been there, he wouldn't have made it. He had typhoid fever. We had two Russian uh, officers living in the house, and when they heard who he was, he uh, had been in Russia, yeah. You know what they did? They brought food uh, uh, for all three months. My dad was in the hospital, and if it had been for those Russians, he wouldn't have made it. And so, um, eventually, um, when, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, when my dad got settled, he found a job. He was originally a coal miner. And um, so then um, one day my mother disappeared. And it ended up, <laughs> she, we found out later, we didn't know where she was. Well, four years later we found out when she was released, she was in Buchenwald, the same camp that the Nazis had, which t had been taken over by the Russians. And uh, <coughs> so uh, she sat there for years, then she was released. Meanwhile, uh, as soon as he came out, uh, they went west. The border was uh, uh, not really closed yet. And they, they came to uh, stay with my grandparents uh, in Hesse. And uh, meanwhile, 
I had started to work for the Americans in 1945. Uh, all I knew how to do was uh, speak English. I had five years of English, so I went to them and say, I want a job. And of course, they were in need of an interpreter, so I was it. I learned to drive every vehicle that the Army had, and uh, I became an interpreter, the lieutenant for which I, in, through my work, was the Lieutenant Force McAllister um, from uh, uh, Ohio. I never managed to track him down, wonderful man. And, uh, and then, um, when this unit I was working for moved to southern Germany, I went away with him. And um, uh, meanwhile, I had met an American soldier, Paul Ingen, whose father was a doctor in Iowa. And um, so Paul was 21 years at the time, uh, 23 years at the time. He said, look, I just found this boy in Germany. I want to help him. And his father said, well, if you like the boy, I'll help him. So he put me in uh, uh, to sponsor me. Sponsor them, and you still do now. I had to wait six years before uh, my number came up, and um, I don't know why it took so long. Why it took so long? Well, first of all, I was in Hitler Youth. We all had to be in Hitler Youth, and then the law said, "Well, this is a criminal organization, and therefore you, know, you can't uh, immigrate." Well, that was changed, and uh, we were no longer a criminal or organization. And uh, so I was stuck on the list. Well, I heard nothing, I heard nothing, I heard nothing. But <coughs> the uh, father of Gieri, a Catholic uh, army chaplain, uh, he became uh, a good friend. He took an interest in me. And I told him that. I said, I'm not getting anywhere. He said, okay, uh, I will call the consul. Now, if an American army chaplain calls the consul in Munich, he gets through, right? And uh, he gave my name, and I said, yeah, I'll call back. And uh, about half hour later, the consul calls back. So we found uh, the record. A short secretary had taken a stack of papers to sit under her butt so she could reach the, uh, uh, reach the typewriter. <coughs> and that's where it sat the whole time. And so then after that, uh, things proceeded swiftly. <coughs> and, um, Eventually, I went uh, to the States in 1951 and then I sailed from Hamburg and I went uh, to Iowa. And uh, when I came to Iowa, I worked in uh, construction uh, 12 hours a day, started at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, in the winter, I unloaded uh, 35 tons of coal, a big trailer by hand. And, uh, and uh, I found out in this country you have to work. And uh, I, don't know, I made fifty dollars a week. I got thirty-two dollars uh, for my uh, deductions. <coughs> well, I decided this wasn't for me. And, uh, so I went to the local, uh, the local uh, uh, high school uh, in Superintendent and told them that all my records had been burned. The Nazis burned everything, including the school records. The party members didn't know their names, and so they burned our school records for good measure. So he gave me the entrance exam for the University of California in order to see where I stood, what I knew, and so on and so forth. And uh, I did quite well. He said, I think you, you can make, but you have a few things that you need to catch up with. So my friend Paul, meanwhile, had uh, been in Chicago, and he was in the music business. So I went to Chicago, lived in the YMCA, and, uh, <coughs> and went uh, to work, and uh, then um, I went to night school, and um, in night school, <coughs> uh, I actually became the class president, and uh, I had to take civics, U.S. history, and math. I was always very bad at math. I had a lousy math teacher. Well, when, uh, <coughs> oh, that's a wrong story. But anyway, I had a very uh, <coughs> insightful uh, woman teacher who was a real educator, and she got me over my problems. <coughs> So well, that's how I got to where I was, and uh, I said that before, without the help of various dedicated people, all of you here, uh, <coughs> this would never have happened. And um, the world is full of problems, but I like to think that we are at least working on the solution. Will it be successful or not, I don't know. Uh, I'm generally more pessimistic, but uh, <coughs> we are not going <coughs> to give up, uh, but uh, we'll do what we can. And, uh, 
think everybody knows who the thing, especially Gladys White, who made it possible for us to study wolves in the comfort of a warm room rather than freezing to death outside. <coughs> and, uh, well, <coughs> I could go on and on, but you know what I'm thinking. So thank you very much, especially for this evening, for coming and uh, sharing this. Thank you.